Hello, everyone, and welcome to a brand new episode of the Record Club of the Jams and D podcast, where each week one of us picks a record for everyone to review, and then we review it. And this week we have Riley's recommended record, which is Dig Your Own Hole. I had no plans on doing otherwise, Mr. The Chemical Brothers, but I, I appreciate the, the, the strictness, sirs. Yeah, I think so. That, tell I think us that... about these, these brothers, Chemical. I think just as an off offside, I think it only really just hit me this week, despite this album being literally in my entire life, that Dig Your Own Hole is kind of like a, a play on Dig Your Own Grave and like K-Holes, like, um, oh. which are referenced in another song on this record, like psychedelic drug uh, trips. Anyway, huh. the Chemical Brothers are a British duo uh, of electronic musicians uh, are originating in the mid nineties and kind of being one of the key and principal purveyors of the big beat maximalist big techno beat. sound uh, that was kind of dominating the UK in that particular era. So you had like house, you had the kind of uh, infusion of techno and acid music and house music in the early nineties. And as the nineties went on in the UK, that as that niche of music got so much bigger and bigger it became for one it became more and more associated with psychedelic drugs which were a huge part of that subculture uh, and second of all it became more and more maximalist more and more intense and also more and more uh, attractive to mainstream audiences so a, a style or a, a kind of a whole world of niche electronic music that was very much centered around the club scene in the early 90s began to kind of like become so big in the UK that it started to infect the mainstream and become genuinely popular. And the Chemical Brothers were one of the kind of leading figures and bastions of this movement. The other two that come to mind are The Prodigy and Fatboy Slim. And all three of these artists had huge commercial success and crossover. And all three of these artists had this at around the same time in the late 90s. And the kind of pivotal year for this is 1997, uh, which is quite coincidentally the year I was born. And in fact, this album that we're going to be talking about today, Dig Your Own Hole, where the Chemical Brothers, their second record, came out two days before I was born on the 7th of April, uh, 1997. And neat little coincidence, but I bring it up because for one, it's turning 25 or it has recently turned 25 as have I and also like it's not just wow these records came out this record came out around the same time I was born but also this record happened to be a huge part of the fabric of my musical upbringing um the Chemical Brothers were my first ever favorite band uh my dad had all of their CDs up until the point where I started getting into them when I was really, really young, I must, I, I, I was probably, he probably played them to me when I was like fucking in preschool and shit, but I, I only really remember becoming cognizant of them. And, and like, you know, when I was old enough to sort of autonomously seek out my own music on like LimeWire and shit, uh, then the, that was around the time in like 2004, 2005, where the Chemical Brothers became a huge fixation for me. And they, they remained a fixation for several years after that. And Dig Your Own Hole, along with their first album, Exit Planet Dust, and their third album, Surrender, these records were CDs that my dad had that became fixtures. Uh, my dad got me a little stereo, that uh, a CD player stereo, and um, the, these three Chemical Brothers albums would be uh, very commonly on rotation when I listened to them. And while I do sort of go back and forth between Dig Your Own Hole and Surrender as to which one is my favorite, I think that Dig Your Own Hole is maybe the most representative of how huge the Chemical Brothers were, what they were doing that was crossing over into the mainstream. This album had a number one single and one of the most, I think, uh, a, U a UK number one single. And I think one of the most wild and insane songs to ever be a number one single in the UK, which is the track Setting Sun with Noel Gallagher. Um, and so you have a record that represented the absolute peak of this maximalist electronic aesthetic. You can see how it takes from hip hop as well as techno as well in some of the, the sampling and the sort of drum breaks that the Chemical Brothers use. 
but you have this style of production that's so loud, that's so heavy, that's so dialed up and the sense of intensity that it almost feels like a precursor to the EDM movement of the 2000s and the 2010s as well. And so it exists in this interesting niche in history where this style of music was very popular in the UK. And I think that the Prodigy had already had like crossover hits with songs like Breathe and uh, Firestarter uh, from Fat of the Land. And Fat of the Land didn't come out until two months after this album. But those singles, I believe, were big before uh, in 1996, I think, early 1997, before this record even came out. And so you had a radio, you had a, a, a British public that were it, it were primed for this kind of music but also like this kind of music was controversial like especially with the prodigy as well like they were making music that was in a lot of ways it was a response to the conservative politics of the time as well um and the government at that time in the uk had issued a number of bills and laws to effectively try and ban rave music and make it illegal to have raves and there was um, a, a very, very controversial bill that was passed in 1993 to try and outright ban uh, club music completely. You had this incredibly strangely antagonistic atmosphere towards this. And yet, despite this, it only got more and more and more popular. And I think even when, when this record became popular, you also started to see some crossover success into the US as well. And I think more so even than Prodigy or Fatboy Slim, uh, the Chemical Brothers are maybe the best example of the crossover success of this deeply British, deeply sort of English brand of maximalist electronic music. And so Dig Your Own Hole, I think, represents the kind of pinnacle of that. Even if I think that a record like Surrender maybe has a little bit more diversity in it, Dig Your Own Hole, I think, is the absolute pinnacle of how intense and attention-grabbing this music can be. And it also helps that in the 90s, the music video era, we talked about this with some of Bjork's most recent records as well, like music videos and the way that art is packaged and consumed on television, uh, music-wise, had a huge influence as well. And you had uh, iconic music videos for this record, most notably the music video for Electrobank, which was directed by Spike Jones and starred Sofia Coppola, at a, a very young Sofia Coppola, very iconic music video. And um, yeah, and so you just had all of this sort of stuff that was creating a sensation around this record and creating a sensation around this music. And so I obviously have lots of thoughts on how I feel about the album and my sort of connections to it and what it is about the album that I connect with and respond to. But I'd love to hear from you guys uh, what your kind of anticipations were. August, I know you've had this record in your, in your life for a little bit longer than Jake has, but what your kind of expectations were for this, this record, this sort of style of music and, and how you feel about about the album itself? Well, the only thing I really knew about it was that, I mean, Riley had mentioned it a bunch of times. And I think other than knowing it was like just vaguely in the world of electronic music, uh, that it was loud. That was the only thing I knew about it. It's just like, shit's loud. And I'm like, okay. And then I looked it up on Rate Your Music and I saw the, the ever pesky tag of, uh, like house music and I'm just like uh this is something that like I, I either just sound like a complete buffoon on if I dislike it which I normally do just because house music typically just isn't my thing um and if I do like it I'll probably still sound like a fucking pleb but at least I'll have some credence to my opinion because this seems to be a bit of a classic um so come to me surprised when I listened to this and was like fuck this knocks uh, I think the coolest thing about it is how much it reminded me, this sounds kind of slight, but like how much it reminded me of other things that I already, already really liked. And I guess I could sort of trace back the musical DNA of a lot of different movements. I think the sort of shared DNA of hip hop uh, really is found in here, specifically with two producers whose work I think was undoubtedly influenced by uh, the Chemical Brothers in some form or fashion, that being uh, Mad Lib and Jay Dilla. Uh, this album has donuts written all the fuck over it. It's just, it's more of its genre. It's, you know, it's not quite instrumental hip hop, but it's that same propulsive, never stop moving. Um, like, I think one song on there that I just like the drum break on it really reminded me of the one on here, like the implementation of bass um, really reminded me of the song uh, Working On It which I think is one of the more like well-knowns on, on there and the way it kind of uses uh, repetition to build everything. 
and I think the coolest part is really just hearing. I'm not exactly sure what parts of it are sampled, and maybe some of it are some of it's organic. I'm I'm not totally certain, but whatever it is that they end up using sounds fucking incredible. I mean, like from the moment that the first track starts, um, which again the fucking black rocking beats. God, that shit's so fucking hard. Iconic, oh, love one of the most iconic on songs yeah. of, of this whole genre, I think, because of just how so fucking in your face it is. Instantly mm. a declaration of purpose throughout for the whole album, really. And like, and again, I wasn't like used to, like, I wasn't really, I guess, prepared for how organic it would sound, just because there's a lot of really conventional sounds in here that I've recognized before that once you loop and once you apply these other in, different instrumentals to, take on a new meaning that really like, I'm, I wasn't, you know, I'm not knowledgeable about the, the countercultural space in which, in which this was brought up, but it really does feel like one of the, like in the nineties, I think we're in time where I think that like repurposing and recontextualizing music that already existed. We saw that with stuff like, you know, the like Tribe Called Quest and shit. They do all their crate digging jazz loops and stuff, just taking things from the past and from already existing musical conventions and making them work within a different cultural context and then making that cultural context the like cutting edge pinnacle of the sound. And I mean, yeah, it's definitely really fucking loud. There's some bass licks that are sampled on here that are just fucking enormous sounding. It sounds like it's being played right next to my ear, but it always sounds fantastic. Like the fact that this is a 25 year old album is kind of astonishing just because it sounds like flawless. I, I really love just the impact of everything. Like, yeah, it's it's like loud, but it's not blunt. Um, I really think that it does a really great job of pacing itself, uh, considering the fact that it does almost like, all. it's almost kind of headache inducing, but it's also in a way, it, it headache inducing in the way that like a lightning bolt record might be. Or another album I actually thought about when listening to this is, which is probably a little bit more tenuous is, I thought a lot about Primal Scream and Scream at Delica. And oh, yeah. like you can kind of yeah. hear the influence of dub here, like not overtly, but I feel like at least structurally, there was a lot of points where on screen Medellica, I like I, I just heard something and I feel like that's sort of the the far reaching influence of 1991's records sort of showing its uh, its face again. I think that was, you know, that was a really popular album for like the British scene of that. But it's just really it, uh, describing its appeal is basically it's really difficult in the sense that it's just it's just really fucking hard. This is like electronic music for people who love rock music, if that makes any sense. Well, this is the the other aspect, I think, that makes the Chemical Brothers so um, special and unique among the, you know, swathe of big beat artists in this time, and why they're my favorite, or at least why I've always kind of connected with the most, is their absolute love of psychedelic rock music and psychedelic textures. And it's one of the things that's not necessarily a, a defining feature of Big Beat, but absolutely is a defining feature of the Chemical Brothers. Yeah, and, and that's it, why I'd say that uh, that comparison to Primal Scream is just spot on. Absolutely. Because of that psychedelic rock influence and crossover appeal. So yeah, I think you're dead on with that one. I think that the Chemical Brothers would say they're as influenced by sort of classic 80s hip hop as they are by the Beatles, like the, the late 60s yeah. Beatles, like Sgt. Pepper's era. And in fact, um, they have multiple songs, one of which is on this record that almost feel like a deliberate attempt to modernize the sound of Tomorrow Never Knows. I always think of that song when yeah. I listen to Setting Sun, and it's even oh, stronger yes. uh, when I listen to the song Let Forever Be off of their album after this. But the influence of the Beatles and the influence of 60s psychedelia, that specific sort of era, I think is so strong. The, end of the song Piku really sounds like Tomorrow Never Knows, those like weird tape effects. Yeah, that, shit. Like, yeah, absolutely. That one, I, great, I, that great really shout. reminds me of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. It, as in the way of, of my opinion on this record, I think a lot of the appeal of this record is just how hyper macho and masculine it is not in like a dumb frat jockey way but in a way of like big muscles big personality loud music it is it is so 
emblematic of that kind of just raucous, like, mm, I'm going to punch you in the face kind of sound because it's just so energetic and that raucous loudness to it is yeah so much of the appeal but what's also part of the appeal is when you have tracks like where do i begin where you can pare that back a little and still kind of build up and climax towards that heaviness and that's what's great about some of the songs on here is that they're so well-structured, longer tracks like uh, the private psychedelic reel breeze by because they are so intricately put together and well done. And, and that's just what I love about this band, that their appeal, the, the gravity they bring to these songs by just structuring them so well makes them so immediately appealing. I mean, I, I've put multiple friends onto this band who aren't like necessarily like going to listen to 300 albums in a year like me, but they're still, but they still can get enjoyment out of this because of just the, the urgency. And I think that's, that's kind of some of the appeal you were talking about with the mainstream Riley, that this band just has a sound that you can connect with the second you hear it and you can get where they're coming from you can understand that just visceral fist mm. pumpingness of it it's uh yeah that and that's all without addressing yeah the psychedelic influence yeah. and such and the thing is like you're right it's a very aggressive and like uh intense album sonically but the thing I've always loved about the Chemical Brothers, and maybe it's true of, of some of their other records than here, but still it is present here, is how in touch they are with and able they are to make sounds that are genuinely beautiful. Like th there's a real craft and a beauty to a lot of the textures uh, on this record, and they just come up against this harshness and this heaviness that, that the, where these two elements kind of elevate each other. And I think um, this is a reason why a song like Where Do I Begin endures, endures so much. Another of the reasons for that is the wonderful vocals of Beth Orton, who sings on one song on each of the first five Chemical Brothers albums. And are, it's always, always, it is always a highlight when she does that. Um, but she has this kind of gorgeously sort of like uh, sort of pop soul tone to her voice. And, and it meshes so beautifully with this kind of, this, this instrumental that sounds almost like it's kind of being played in reverse and it kind of just sort of builds and builds and builds until it, it kind of explodes and then deconstructs and I love the way that they do that um that they the Chemical Brothers I think have two modes on this album one of them is like creating this sort of like more song-based you know condensed hit of like really immediate shit and the other mode is like going on these kind of like extended tangents where it's like you feel like this is designed for the club and it, they flip between these two modes i think with a, a surprising amount of elegance like one i think stretch of this record that tends to get a little bit poo-pooed is the middle stretch of this record from it doesn't matter through don't stop the rock through get up on it like this which is kind of like a suite of club banger instrumental music um it's not one of the high peaks of the record for me, but I've always felt it was a little bit undervalued for how they kind of put this sequence of really great, intense, proper club like shit. That's the little part of the album. That's kind yeah. of bewildering to me, honestly. That's like the ones that are the most immediate, I guess. Yeah, but I've always People sort of, I've always come back to uh, the songs on this record that really meld these different textures that they're able to do with like compelling central elements like i i've always my favorite song on this record has always been setting sun uh the noel gallagher feature oh, yeah. song here the the, mm, the, yes. the drum you oh, can see God. how the drum break is influenced by tomorrow never knows but like it's so heavy the drum breaks on this song are so loud so compressed that like if you listen to the song loud and really like the only way to listen to this band is by playing them loud then it can actually like hurt your ears like the way in which those drums are made to sound so fucking serrated is like in incredible and just the again those psych psychedelic textures that they use to like form the melody of the song are so like blown out in and of themselves like it's 
it's crazy to fathom that this was that the number one hit single song when you just think about like how unfriendly it is texturally like the yeah. way in which when noel gallagher is singing the verses on the song like his vocals are like overpowered by this like really loud kind of persistent weird just sound that's just kind of yeah. like oh my gosh oh so, uh brace barely even tell it's him and it's noel fucking gallagher one of the most easily recognizable vocal premises in all of rock music yeah yeah yeah. And oh gosh, and there's that like and that's the thing. The vocals here are this is a great example of vocals as an instrument in electronic music where Noel Gallagher's voice on that song in particular is a texture more than it is his voice. It is just this because yeah, I mean, look, the songwriting on here is not what you're coming to this for. No. It just sound it, I mean, it sounds fun. And, and it's like, oh, hell yeah, block, rock, and beats. That's all you need. Who gives a shit? <laughs> Who was this doing the synthetic top alpha beta psychedelic pumpkin? Exactly. God, shit. Hell so. yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I fucking love the it fucking too, man. sirens in Setting Sun, the little like, oh, I love that shit so much. There's so many moments on this album where they just take like the sample of one sound and they like distort and warp it into something else. And it's just like, you feel like, you're in a rave in a, the, the Gaspar Noé movie climax. It's just so fucking intense. I, absolutely. Um, one of my favorite like progressions on this record is um, well, another absolute standout for me, the song Electro Bank, which should have just kind of builds slowly over its eight minute runtime and sort of has this kind of like hype up sample that's also so kind of distorted that it's barely even intelligible. And you have like this groove that sets in that's so like, it's like a purring of a, of, a, of a fucking engine. And it's just kind of gradually kind of pulling you in until eventually the song kind of just explodes. And for me, this is so tied in with that uh, music video with Sofia Coppola, uh, ballet dancing. And it's a really, really like crazy video. And, um, and, and then like the song kind of just, there's a moment that happens towards the end of the song where you feel like it's kind of found its level and and then it kind of slows down and you get this kind of like dirgy part towards the end of the song that's so like blown out and slow but it sounds like fucking huge and epic and it feels like the song is swallowing itself and it's just like the most amazing amazing thing for me i, I like ever since i heard that as a child like i've been so like just fascinated with like the way that these songs can kind of just build up explode and then kind of swallow themselves but still feel like they don't lose any of that intensity it's it's like god it's something fucking celestial man it's just <sighs> fuck i mean yeah that's the it's it's just such a primally exciting album it's so primally appealing and i think a, a bit of the kind of packaging and titling of this album shit like uh i mean yeah dig your own hole setting sun it does like the titles are just so lightly evocative of feelings that it it gives these songs like an even extra character with mm. that kind of context yeah absolutely and i think even down to the vocal performances here as well they're, they're like super um suited and in tune with with the vibe that's being evoked and like the thing that's always like i think kept me so what's interesting about big beat is that in the early 2000s it kind of just fell apart it kind of just washed away uh, artists like fat boy slim and junkie excel and um even and the prodigy kind of just either became faded into irrelevance or just moved on to completely different things but the Chemical Brothers stayed. The Chemical Brothers were able to remain and sustain a commercially successful career right up to the present day. And they've had a consistently, like they have a couple of bad albums, but for the most part, almost all of their records are really, really strong. And I even think that their last couple of records, well, not so much Born in the Echoes, but their last record, No Geography from 2019, was really strong. And I think uh, Further from 2010 is a super underrated album. That's just a fantastic electronic record. They've always managed to stay fresh and exciting and interesting. And I think a lot of that longevity comes back to the fact that if you compare them, if you compare a record like Dig Your Own Hole to like other big beat albums of the time, like 
the the textures and sounds are like significantly less dated to me uh like there, there's just a sense with which yeah. this music still has a real cutting edge to it that even the greatest records from like the prodigy and uh junkie xl and fat boy slim don't have as much anymore i mean the the appeal of those bands are more rooted in catch i think and whereas with dig your own hole it feels like this is a record that's really stood the test of time and you've kind of alluded to that already with like the feeling of like this was made in 1997 like and that i think does come through in the way that they have able been able to i think capture so much of their era like this is unmistakably 90s to me they capture so much of the era and yet they don't feel entirely trapped within it as a listening experience when you put it on. That's the thing I think that made me want to really get us to, to talk about and discuss this record and, and, and also just got me thinking about it because like this record's as old as me and it still sounds like fresh and it still sounds current. It's like in a weird way, it like it inspires me listening to this record um, to like, you know, to, to keep kind of trying to, to innovate and create in my own way, even though I'm not a musician or even that good of an artist. It's, it's just a record that I continue to come, I can continue to come back to and find inspiration for whatever I need. And, and on that note, I think we have to talk about the closer on this record, the, the yes. epic nine minute yes. uh, private psychedelic reel, which is, I mean, fucking amazing <laughs> like fucking like, what like holy shit like the, as soon as the first drum break comes in about like a minute into that song and it starts to kind of like hype you up and you have like all these cool panning effects that are happening and you have these little samples that are looped and then you have the fucking clarinet that incidentally is played by one of the members oh. of mercury rev i think uh, that comes into this song and it sounds so processed and th- synthesized but it also sounds so huge and like man like what what a, I, I i don't want to talk dominate all the talking here like i take it you guys really dig this track too the beginning of this song it starts out like the the sort of electronic atmosphere of it reminds me of something that you would find on like the campfire head phase except instead of being driven by a guitar it's driven by a sitar and it's like what fucking galaxy brain shit is this nonsense (laughs) like it's just such a like it's such a beguiling way to start the song you're just kind of like okay what's this going to evolve into and it becomes like basically like if the first song on the album is like a thesis statement for and a like a statement of like purpose i guess for the goal this is just like the perfect sort of you know dotting the i's crossing the t's wrapping the the ribbon around everything it's just it's such a dynamic song it takes advantage of its runtime super duper well like in the middle of it it's just so fucking like it's just so chaotic it sounds like a fucking like burial track if you like maximized the gain and then doubled the speed on it it's fucking nuts um it- it's a song that I think is super influential on another one of my favorite maximalist electronic acts, which is Fuck Buttons. And mm. their music is super indebted to this era of Chemical Brothers, I think. Because Fuck Buttons are like, they're an electronic band that combine post-rock song structures with electronic noise music. And a lot of their shit is very much influenced by this particular era of maximalist electronica and a song like private psychedelic reel would fit right in on a record like tarot sport or slow focus like and, and i just have i'm such a sucker for that aesthetic where you're hearing like what you would traditionally associate a song structure you would traditionally associate with like i don't know a prog rock song um mm-hmm. where it kind of builds and has this kind of like epic solo that's happening in it and it's kind of just going nuts and yet everything is is like completely within, immersed within this electronic music world. And so all the teachers feel unique and you're hearing like a song structure that's longer and satisfying and gratifying and, and appeals to that taste that you have for, for these you know epic tracks. And yet it's doing all of that with textures you've never heard in that context before. So that's why I think it's like such a, a, a really great and gratifying thing to listen to. Because it appeals you to something what this that we all love. Song reminds me of is this shit reminds me of Flying Lotus. Why did I never fucking think about that? This shit reminds me of like Cosmogram. Oh god, he owes so much 
to this yeah. band. Mm. One thing <laughs> I love about this track are the way the drum breaks are utilized, which is so insane how they can basically take these gigantic titanic movements, bring them to a brief stop for this do 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 do, and then it's just like do do do, and then it comes right back in, and it's so epic when that there, happens there's a cool moment in like the midsection kind of breakdown slow part of the song where the drums are kind of just doing this and they're like shit. cutting in and out and it's just like so fucking hype and shit and i just love that shit like it's it's really cool like you have a lot of electronic music from this era where like the drums are like the drum sounds are so clearly synthetic and they're so clearly electronic and sure there's a you can hear a synthetic tonality here but they also have this tangible like you know, earthiness to them. They feel like they're being played live and just processed through a filter. And so like, mm-hmm. it, it just adds this extra level of like, of ability, I think, from, from people to connect to it because it feels so like intuitively, you know, like it's it's taking from conventional rock music, from conventional drumming, and it's just a, a, appropriating it in this new context. In the same way that, you know, early hip hop did with the foundations of like the innovations of the drum break. Like it's just that innovation being reapplied. That innovation was taken from rock music. And then here it is being reapplied uh, in a new way, in a new form of electronic music. So it's just, just shit, man. It's just like fucking, it's fucking. And you can just like smoke a doobie and listen to Lost in the K-Hole and just fucking have a, a fucking, yeah, just have a fucking sick time. Like I, I fucking I love this shit. Um, you also shout out Piku as well. Really underrated song. I really love yes. that track. That song is so like, especially the way it, it comes out of uh, Electro Bank, and it just has these like mm. really like intense textures that are like so like. I, I love when they make shit sound like it's being played in reverse, uh, and yet they it, do that a lot on here. Yeah, and oh, that's a yes, psychedelic yes. thing as well, like tape loops that they've kind of like the, the, the Beatles kind of used as well, and they've kind of appropriating the that sound here. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's just so fucking good, man. Like, I don't know. I, I just I, I love this record, and I'm 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 stoked that it's getting some love here as well. And um, yeah, it, it just feels like the kind of record is so about unique. The only good thing to come out of Britain in the last hundred years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, and all I can say is, <laughs> is um, yeah, the Kim Bros are, are they're a great, great duo who've always sort of stayed on the cutting edge. They've managed to maintain a degree of integrity and uniqueness even when they went, then f- even when they went fully pop, uh, with with subsequent records and um, the the way in which they've been able to like stay at the for- relative forefront of like popular electronic music across so much time when like what they do would could has been so easily gimmickified like i i just have so much admiration for that um they even have a song on their album push the button that uh has uh kelly from block party on it and i don't think that feels right i can't explain why it's not a great song it's from one of their weaker records but like it's 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 kind of cool to hear him like they have a great they, there's a lot of instances where they've like taken like oh the, the song there's a song on come with us their fourth album that has uh richard ashcroft of the verve uh doing the oh, vocals shit. on it and that's a great fit because like he has a voice that's so like psychedelic um, look man I mean, just, as long as Brothers kelly isn't the talking about party album that wouldn't suck as long as kelly isn't talking about like magic sex or whatever i'm i'm fine uh, it's not quite that bad but it, there's um there's moments um he, I don't want he, to talk about Kelly's K hole. Yeah, there's uh, a <laughs> um, Jake. I think uh, I think the record surrender might appeal to you even more than this one because it's where they kind of like lean f- really more fully into the psychedelic aspect um, of their sound. And there's a song on there that's like straight up a Mazzy Star song, uh, and it even has Hope Sandoval singing on it. Um, oh shit! Uh, so I think you'll dig that record. It's really really pretty. Um, but anyway, yeah um oh and it has let forever be which is another noel gallagher song that also slaps but anyway i'm getting ahead of myself great album uh i, I just I, I it still sounds fresh it still sounds original and yet and still sounds current and yet it also still takes me back to my childhood every time i listen to it um my childhood yeah yeah i that 
this was like on rotation around the same time as I was like listening to Flaming Lips a lot as well as a kid because they're like I, I was primed to like psychedelic music so much by my dad like how do I do drugs without doing drugs yeah it's funny it's funny that I didn't become like a complete junkie considering the type of music that my dad <laughs> yeah, raised no, me on. It, it is quite humorous the fact that you're not cripplingly addicted to drugs <laughs> Yeah, although I, I'm kind of rocking an aesthetic that I think is kind of looks vaguely stonerish at the moment, although that's purely a, a pro, uh, it's purely a product of not getting enough sleep and also being depressed. But I'll take it. Sounds cheers, Word bro. Up. I'll drink to that. Uh, anyway, Word anything up, else? Anything man. else that you guys wanted to shout out or comment on or anything else you got to shout out? This for all the the OGs. The narrator and word girl was the same voice as Jerry Smith and Rick and Morty. That blew my fucking mind. And if you know what I'm talking about, it'll blow yours too. That's all I got. I'm sorry, did you just reference word girl? Yes, I did. Jesus Christ, I haven't thought about that in like a decade. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Um, All right, right. so Riley, what are your three favorite tracks in these three? What are your three favorite episodes of Word Girl? (laughs) I I don't. I don't even know what you're talking about. That's fine. (laughs) Um, My three favorite tracks on this album are Setting Sun, um, Electro Bank, and Private Psychedelic Reel. Fucking kills me not to be able to put Where Do I Begin in my top three, but there we go my least favorite track um i don't know probably get up on it like this i guess but i don't really separate those three songs in the middle because they just run into each other and they feel like one single suite and also get up on it like this has this weird like like uh tonality to it that feels super like uh just 80s dj stretchy to me it's really like it's it's probably the kitschiest thing here anyway um yeah i love this album eight out of ten all right, for me, it's going to be Set in Sun, Block Rockin' Beats, and Where Do I Begin? Uh, least favorite thing on here is a bit of a tough call because I think it is a pretty uniformly good album, great album even. Yeah, I might actually agree with uh, Get Up on it like this, which is eh, just fine. Either way, I also agree on the rating of 8 out of 10. Oh, yeah. Did you say your favorite tracks? Or did I just blank yes, out? I, I, just, I yep. just blanked out briefly, don't worry. It's yeah. not, not concerning at all. Um, Jake, we know. your turn. Wake up, Gotta right. go with Block, Rock, and Beats, A Private Psychedelic Reel, and yeah, The Setting Sun um least favorite song probably it doesn't matter um and i also give the album an eight wow the the uniform rate of deviations going crazy yeah so that means that we have an 8.0 for the chemical brothers dig your own hole which i find immensely gratifying every time i recommend like a a childhood classic of mine, mine where you all haven't already everyone hasn't already heard it i get really nervous so that was gratifying all right let us know at home what you think of the chemical brothers dig your own hole what your relationship is with the chemical brothers music is this your favorite kimbo's record do you have another one you want to shout out Um, have you dug your own hole i Mm. i highly recommend uh listening to surrender and further they are the second and third best chemical brothers records respectively so if you want to hear more of this band at their best then those two records are essential listens if you enjoyed this episode please make sure you consider giving it a like if you're watching on youtube uh, and if you're listening on spotify or apple head on over to the youtube link in the description give us a like subscribe to the channel if you have not already leave us a comment if you would like to we really appreciate them when we get them and if you want to go above and beyond you can support us even more by hitting the join button on our youtube page and for just one dollar a month you can support the channel get your name featured in the title call of every episode on this channel you can get priority comment response and if you want to recommend us a record to listen to your recommendation will go to the top of the pile august take us home as always rock, rock, beats. rock over london rock on chicago tog hoyer don't crack under pressure don't fucking talk about my crack <laughs>